Nothing on the screen this morning, so you're going to have to play by the old-fashioned rules. You're going to have to open your Bible up this morning. First place I want you to open your Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, I like the technology that we have. I like using it. In fact, I am going to be using it up here behind the pulpit. Uh, <clears throat> as a guide to know where I'm supposed to go next. This is our, part of a series on prayer. One of the things that I learned about prayer is that the devil has the power to corrupt everything that God gives to us as a blessing, as a gift, and in my mind, there is no greater gift than the two blessings that God, that God avails us to use. That is prayer and Bible reading. Uh, I believe in church attendance. I believe in not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another even so much the more as you see the day approaching. I don't know about you. It's coming. It may take a few years. But it is coming. And we're finding now. And I, and I didn't live in another time. I don't know what it was like in another time. I know what it's like in my time. And I know now, living in America now, just how easily accessible sin is to even our children. Which is why when we go to camp, we don't let them carry their tablets and their phones and their video games around and things like that. We take that away from them. Jaden's going to ride with Lisa and I. And he said, Paul, Paul, can I watch my tablet on the way down? I said, yep, yeah, but when we pull into camp, it's mine. It's going, going locked up. And uh, it's to get them away from the ways that the devil approaches our children. If you think that everything that's designed for children on Nickelodeon, Disney, YouTube is safe for your children, you're wrong. The devil has inroads, especially by way of teaching them magic, magic, wizardry, sorcery, witchcraft. That is big amongst the children's entertainment industry. All you got to do is watch Disney for a day and you'll see how much influence that witchcraft has on children nowadays. It is no wonder that we're, they're, we're raising hell's devils as children in this country right now it is no wonder when we have when we have young people at the youngest age that are listening to lyrics and songs that were not even allowed on the radio back when i was a child if you wanted to sing about certain perversion things if you remember back during the 70s when i grew up they had to they had to hide them certain ways and uh, sweeten them up a little bit. Now the songs that are out are very extremely vulgar, demeaning, racist, evil, harmful, rebellious. Rebellion itself is as the sin of witchcraft. And children grow up listening to this music. It is unfettered to them. They are fed a steady diet of this, and it is no wonder that we are in the shape that we are in in this country, and it's not going to get better as these children get older. Absolutely not going to get better. But the devil corrupts everything, and he corrupts prayer. Over the last several years, I've done many teachings on various prayer types. Some of it called contemplative prayer. They call it whispering prayer. Uh, they call it Ignatian contemplation. That means that Ignatius de Loyola, the head of the Jesuit branch of the Catholic Church, invented this. He did not read it out of the Bible. He read occult books and he taught his Jesuit priest, the Pope that we have right now is a Jesuit Pope. And he has learned these Jesuit um, 
Jesuit, what they call spiritual practices. And he has practiced Ignatian contemplation. Let me tell you what that is. It stems from Eastern religions. And it tells you that in order to reach God, that you can actually reach God without going through the mediator, Jesus Christ. Let me assure you that that is impossible for anyone to do. There must be a mediator between you and God or God does not hear the prayer. I don't like prayers that are prayed in thy name. I don't like prayers that are prayed. Um, God, we thank you for this. Amen. If you're going to pray, you bring Jesus into the scene because he is the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. That has been taken out and corrupted. But these whispering prayers, Lectio Divina is another name for it. It says, take a portion of scripture, just a small portion, like, for God so loved the world. Repeat it over and over and over again without thinking about its meaning. Now, what was the one thing that Jesus taught us about repetitive prayers? Learn not the way of the heathen. In the way that they repeat over and over. For they think they shall be heard for what? They're much speaking. In a convent or in a monastery, that is precisely what is done. You have nuns and monks that they, they say that they're in there praying. What they're doing is that they are repeating chants that have been written down for them or that they have memorized. Uh, the Eternal Word Television Network, EWTN, it's on your satellite, maybe on your cable TV, it was started by a Catholic nun, and it used to feature, for about an hour, nuns sitting there praying the rosary. They were praying the Hail Mary, then they would pray the Our Father, and then when they would touch another bead, they'd start it all over again. Hail Mary, full of grace, Our Father which art in heaven. Touch another bead, and they would film this for an hour, none sitting there repeating the same prayers over and over and over again. What else bothers me about that is the Catholic Church gives those prayers out as punishment for you when you confess your sins to God. They, they say, okay, Christ will pay for part of this, but you have to do penance. You're punished now. You must pray 30 Hail Marys, 60 Our Fathers. They're telling you that praying now is a punishment that you must do in order to appease God. That's out of hell. That is a hellish, satanic, evil, wicked doctrine. It is seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Somebody say amen. Go ahead. It, it, it angers me. It angers me to take this what it was intended to be the simplest thing for a man to do is to cry out unto God. And the devil has corrupted that. But this con contemplative prayer or Ignatian contemplation or Lectio Divina, it's basically repeating the chant over and over until you have made your mind a void. It is Eastern mysticism meditation, transcendental meditation. You completely lose functions of your critical thinking process. You shut down the entire left brain. So that they say when you do that, you've created a space for God. I'm sorry. God is the one who creates his own space in my life. You don't need to create no space for God. He'll take what's his. Amen. But they say now when you get there, they call it whispering prayer. Because you will reach down inside your inner being and make contact with God directly who is in you and He will whisper back to you. Now, you may not know this. In fact, let me... Uh, I've got, I got my deal up here where I can uh, look up certain things so I can preach this right. Turn to uh, Isaiah 29, 4. Let me, tell you, let me tell you who whispers. Does God whisper? 
What does it mean when Elijah heard the still, small voice? Was that a whisper? No. He heard the voice. A whisper is speaking without what? Vocal cords. I don't have to use my vocal cords to speak. God did not speak to Elijah in a whisper. He spoke to him in a very quiet voice, but it was definitely a voice. Isaiah 29. Look at this. Verse 4. Thou shalt be brought down and shall speak out of the ground. Where did, the, where did Samuel or that fake spirit that looked like Samuel come up from when Saul went to the witch of Endor to speak to Samuel? Where did he come from, Jody? Out of the ground. Thou shalt speak out of the ground and thy speech shall be low out of the dust and thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit. Out of the ground and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. When it's a whisper, it is not God. It is a familiar spirit. You're in contact with the devil. You're receiving. And there's been guys on popular TV and TV shows spreading the idea that you empty the mind, you hear this whispering voice from God, then you write down what the voice said, and that is your Bible for today. That is hellish. That is seducing spirits. That is satanic doctrine. That has replaced biblical prayer inside of the churches. I had a conversation with a lady years ago when we first started this ministry. She called me. She lived over somewhere in Illinois. She said she was going to a um, Assembly of God church, and she had heard one of my videos on uh, the contemplative or the contemporary church, and she said the pastor is talking about. Uh, going into a $10 million building program, going to have to build a new building for this. I said, have you got a building now? She said, yeah, it's a fine building. And, and I said, let me tell you the rest of it. He's going to take out the hymn books. She said, they've already done that. Took out all the hymn books. They've got a big praise band up on I said, let me tell you what he's going to do next. He's going to start talking about a new form of prayer that you can get, that you can pray to give you power and get you in contact directly with God. And it's going to be called contemplative prayer, whispering prayer. Uh, Lectio Divina, she said, he preached that last Sunday. I said, you get out of that church. That pastor's not hearing from God. He's hearing from devils is who he's hearing from. Now, 2 Corinthians 11, turn there. Now I have to get back to my search engine again. I know the first two places I'm going to. Let me get to the last of it. 2 Corinthians 11. Paul said it would happen exactly the way it's happening right now. Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly and indeed bear with me. For I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Yes, your pastor is jealous over you. It's not my ego. I mean, I, I have become very, very comfortable with seeing few people in the pews knowing how many families are online watching us now, knowing how many people are going to hear this message. I, I'm not out for the numbers. It was easy when we went through the, through the COVID shutdown for me to come in here by myself and preach. I do it every week. I sit and stare at a camera and talk into a microphone. I'm comfortable with it. God has made me at ease with the fact that we may never fill these pews, but if everybody that, sh everybody that listens showed up here now, we wouldn't be able to fit them even in the parking lot. I'm comfortable with that. I'm, it's not an ego thing that I'm jealous over you. I'm jealous because I know how the devil moves into people's lives. I have been pastor long enough to see people come in and fall out I know how it's happened. I know what the devil's tried to do with me personally to kick me out of this place. So I know his playbook. I know how he works. And, when, and if things that have happened in the past it's, and you've seen me down, it's because I am already detecting that the devil is moving in our midst and it's just a matter of time. One, one year 
for about three months, I preached sermon after sermon to about two people in this church. Didn't name them. Still won't name them. You'll never know who they were. But it was because I knew what the devil was doing. And I was jealous over them because I wanted God to take over in their life and I knew they were in rebellion to it. So I understand this. Paul said, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. What is, why is God jealous? What does God get jealous over? Thou shalt have no other gods before me, for I am a jealous God. And your wife might be able to see it in you. Your husband might be able to see it in you. Your own children will be able to see it in you. They can tell when you're not, they, how you act at church, not how you act at home. They can, they can tell things are not right. I fear lest by any means. Wait a minute, i got to back up. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. I have preached that so many times in the last, I don't know, 20 years. How the devil does it. How he works in. He's subtle. He's a snake. You never hear a snake's footsteps coming. You never hear a snake tromping through the woods. You never know the snake is there until it's absolutely too late. He said, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Listen, if I was nine years old and can get saved, some children get saved as young as seven years old. I've seen children get saved at five years old. It is different with every child. But if a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old child can understand enough to get saved, then it's simple. You cry out, God save me. Let Jesus live in my heart. We show them the verses out of the Bible. The easy ones. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A nine-year-old child knows that they've done wrong. You had no idea the number of candy bars I had stolen by the time I was nine years old. But I got pretty good at it. I knew I was a sinner and I knew I was on my way to hell and I knew at nine years old, that's the last place you want to go when you're nine years old. I'm 55 years old. That is the last place I want to go. In fact, I don't want to go. The simplicity in Christ. There is simplicity in salvation. There is simplicity in Bible reading. There is simplicity in prayer. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, when you are taught a different prayer, you are on your way to receiving another spirit. And by the way, don't let anybody slap you on the forehead. Don't let anybody do that. Paul, the Apostle Paul said, lay hands on no man suddenly. And what are these guys, what does Benny Hinn go around doing? What did Ernest Angley go around doing? They go around slapping people on the head and everybody's falling down backwards? That, show me that in the Bible. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul knew, Paul knew that after he left that church, people would slip in, preach another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And Paul said, you'll sit there and listen to him. So he said, now listen to me and my foolishness for just about five minutes. And I'm warning you, don't let anybody remove you from the simplicity of what prayer is. Now turn your Bible to Mark chapter 4, if you would please. Mark chapter 4. I believe it's Mark 4. <clears throat> Here we go. Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> I'll never forget one right after Lisa had Lindsay. <clears throat> Lindsay was our wake up child. She was the one that woke us up that we had to be adults now and couldn't be kids anymore. 
We had to take life serious. And uh, not too long after we had Lindsay, me and Lisa was sitting there, I guess where Dee and Jared are sitting now, on a Wednesday night. And all of a sudden, Lisa said, Lindsay's down in the nursery crying. I'm going, what? She ain't either. She said, she is. I can hear. I better go down there and find out what's going wrong. Now, do you believe my wife? You can hear your kids a mile away, can't you? Now, you look in the Bible. Mark chapter 4. Brother Reg Kelly came years ago and preached something like this. And he said, Here's, I'm going to show you the dumbest question in the whole Bible. The stupidest question in the whole Bible. Verse, Mark chapter 4, verse 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so now it was full. How many of you have been in that storm before? Maybe you're in it now. Who's in the ship? Christ. He was in the hinder, verse 38, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, now, watch this now. How did they say it? Uh, master, uh, carest thou not that we perish? Is that how they did it? Did they say, oh, great Jesus, the one who created the heaven and the earth, the one who walked on the water, the one... Did they do it like that? How did they do it? Master, care so not that we perish? Isn't that how they did it? And Reg called that the stupidest question in the Bible. God sent him down here because he cared whether or not we perish. That's why he came. And he arose. Now, did they even have to tell him what they wanted him to do? No. Did they have to name it? And believe it with all their might. And have all the faith. And say all the right words. No. They just ask, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus was the one. Remember the adult in the room that I mentioned last Sunday? He's the adult on, on board here. The children were crying the master heard them and knew immediately what to do better. Now, did, had, and ask this question, had Jesus ever taught them and drilled them on, now if you're ever in a storm with me, call upon me and I will arise then and rebuke the storm. Did he even tell them that? No. They had no idea what to do about the storm. They just knew they were about to die. I've been there. I've been there. I knew I was about to die. And I'll be honest with you. I don't think I ever, while I was being electrocuted, asked God to save me from that. I don't think I did. The last thought I remember was, I'm not ready to leave my wife and kids. And immediately, God knew how to do the rest. That, my friends, 
is the simplicity of prayer. If I don't say another word today, you learn that lesson. It doesn't have to be the prayer that's 30 to 45 minutes long. It doesn't have to be full of praise and worship words and how great God is. It doesn't have to be written in a book somewhere. It doesn't even have to be right out of scripture. I'm going to show you in a minute what it is. He arose and rebuked the wind and said unto thee, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Now remember who Satan is? He's the prince of the power of what? The air. Who was he rebuking when he said, Peace, be still? Satan. Satan himself. Now, I'm going to work my way. You turn to the book of Psalms. What have I always told you was the medicine chest of God? Book of Psalms. It is, the, it is where God keeps his Tylenol, his ibuprofen, his antidepressants, his oxycodone, his morphine... I mean, you know, for the hard stuff, okay? That's where he keeps all of his good medicine. And he don't lock it up. He gives you easy access to it because it's right in the smack dab middle of your Bible. And I'm going to read to you. I'm just going to follow the word cry. Cry. In the book of Psalms, five, turn to Psalm 5. <clears throat> Psalm 5. You just might as well keep your Bible open there. Psalm 5. I want to do this fast. We got to get on the road, but I want I, I got to teach you this. In fact, I I really believe this is probably the message God wanted me to preach anyway. Give ear to my words, O Lord, verse 1. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my what? Cry. My King, my God, for unto thee will I... What's that word? When you pray, it is as simple as crying. I've got a granddaughter... <clears throat> that may never speak a day in her life. They don't even know yet if it's cerebral palsy or not. The tests, they have not figured out what's wrong with her yet. They're going to have to put a, uh, like a feeding tube in her <clears throat> because she does not, uh, for some reason her body's not absorbing nourishment. But when she cries, my wife has been a mom and a grandma long enough to know what that means. I, I'm a dad. I don't understand baby. I, I like them better when they talk a little bit. My wife can't stand them much when they learn to talk because then they start getting... But I just, I think it's funny. But do you not think God understands what crying is? And what effect your crying to God has on Him? If it'll move my wife's heart, my granddaughter, or any of my grandchildren, or my children, when they cried to her, when my wife sat there and said, Lindsay's crying, she needs me. I said, baloney. And she said, no, she does. She got right up and went downstairs. Sure enough, she was down there crying. Prayer is crying. It's as simple as crying out to God. 
Psalm 912. <clears throat> Let's back up a little bit. Verse 9. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed and a refuge in times of what? Trouble. <clears throat> and it says, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that do what? Seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion, declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of who? The humble. See, it's not that arrogant, cocky guy that Jesus said, Oh, listen to him pray. Oh, he prays long and loud and he does it out in the street. Oh, listen to him. Oh, surely God listens to him. That's not what Jesus said. Here's this poor man said, God have mercy on me a sinner, which is what I prayed under my house. God heard my prayer. And the adult there knew exactly what to do. Uh, to this day, I have no idea what separated my right shoulder from, from being bound to that electrical current. But it left, the scar is still there to this day. I've had this shoulder operated on because of the damage it did. I have no idea what separated my arm from that iron beam that held the circuit together. But it was God who knew how to do it. All I did was cry to Him and tell Him what I wanted. And God has done the rest. I'm still here with my wife and kids. Psalm 17. Thank you, God, for helping me lose my message. Psalm 17, verse 1. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my... Give ear unto my... That's twice now your Bible has stuck them together. You know what that is? That's a double witness. That's enough for you right there to have doctrine. Am I right on that, Gary? Gary's my resident seminarian here. He's been, to, he's been up there. And he knows the rules too. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, let every word be established. And twice now in your Bible, God has linked crying with prayer. Now you tell me, does it get any simpler than that? You know what the Bible says? That God takes every tear you cry and He stores them in a bottle. He saves them as a memorial to the tears that you shed. Now, one thing that I remember from the message that I thought I was going to preach this morning, I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 9 about those tears. <clears throat> In Ezekiel chapter, you're going to Ezekiel 9. In Ezekiel chapter 8, God took Ezekiel in the Spirit through the temple and was showing him that the corruption existed greatly in the leadership. The religious leadership of the people of Israel was totally and absolutely corrupt. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. In the places that no one in the world was allowed to go into, which was the tabernacle, the temple of God, only the high Levite priests could go in there. God showed Ezekiel that the leadership of the religion of the Jews at that time was absolutely and totally corrupted. They had pictures painted on the walls of the temple that were ungodly. They were probably pornographic. That's just my guess. But they had, they had a standing image in there. They were burning incense to false gods. They had turned their back against the temple of God, praying toward the way. They turned their back to God inside his own house. And God let Ezekiel see that. And I'm here to tell you that it wouldn't surprise me a bit to find in the upper levels of practically every religious Christian movement and every denomination, there is nothing but almost near total corruption going on right now. And after showing him that, 
in Ezekiel chapter 9, God says, see these six guys here? Grab them. They had swords, but one of them had a rider's ink horn. And he says to the one, in verse 4, The Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that what? Cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. When God put his seal on their forehead, this is not the mark of the beast. This is the seal of God in their foreheads. When God had that man put a seal on the people who cried for what's going on in their country, they were not slain while everybody else was slain with the sword. God spared the ones who prayed. Because they sighed and they cried for what was going on in their country. And I get so angry when I see the corruption in Washington, D.C., when I see the corruption in Jefferson City, when I see the corruption in Chicago, that Beetlejuice-looking mayor up in Chicago, up there screaming about social justice, and in one weekend, 22 people were killed last weekend, including a man and a woman who were a white man and woman pulled out of their car Shot down in the street in cold blood. Killed. For nothing. And she's up there talking about critical race theory. It's wicked. Let's keep going. Back in Psalm. Turn to Psalm 18. Beetlejuice looking mayor. <laughs> if you've never seen the movie Beetlejuice, you don't know what I'm talking about. But she looks just like that character. And she's a queer lesbian. You know that, don't you? They elected her. Or maybe she that's Chicago. She probably elected herself. Who knows? Psalm 18. Verse 4. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. This is the days of Noah we're heading into. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. And then look what happened. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundation also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Now, when you get home today, you pull up the Watchman broadcast. I got it uploading right now. You're going to see what this, you're going to see what this is in the context of. You take these verses that I just read to you. Go watch the Watchman broadcast. It's all scripture. Most of it. And I will show you the context of this. You're going to need these verses in your mind and in your heart one of these days. Because God is going to shake this earth terribly. And when He does, we're going to cry unto the Lord and He's going to hear us. And He's going to cause us to stand while everybody else... What happens when you have an earthquake? What happens to buildings and people and trees? and They fall. We're not. We're going to stand. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're going to stand. Psalm 22. <clears throat> hey, if Jesus can do it, so can you. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who said that? On the cross. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like God wasn't listening? Remember, if you moms can hear your baby crying a mile away. And by the way, my mom, I don't know, people, we just don't do this anymore because we don't let our kids even out of our sight anymore. It's too dangerous. But I used to run all over the neighborhood we grew up in. 
But I guarantee at supper time, when my mom stepped out on the porch and started calling my name, no matter where I was, I heard it. I got used to hearing it, because if I didn't hear it, and then I got home, ouch. Now look at verse 2. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not in the night seasons, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. So if God, if God can save your... For See, he gave you a Bible full of people who trusted God. Even sinful people who trusted God. Samson, the strongest man in the Bible, had one weakness. He loved whores. He loved sluts. He loved women that just just gave, him, gave themselves to him. He loved all of those women. And he was with one Delilah, who he ended up losing his power to. And then God forsake him even then, he put his hands up against the two pillars and said, God, one last time, give me strength. And the Bible says he killed more of his enemies in his death than he did in his life. And let me tell you, even if you cry until your death, your death is your greatest victory ever. Don't even be afraid of that one when it comes. You need some more? Psalm 27. I didn't even get to the, I was going to get to the word cried, crying, criest. <clears throat> I don't have time for that. You do when you get home. You finish the message for me. Psalm 27, verse 2. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat me up, to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart should not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in His temple. There should be only one goal in your life. And that is to go to heaven. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not away thy servant in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. If everybody in this earth leaves you, you still have God your Father. Somebody say amen. amen. Verse 11, and I'm going to quit. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. The plain path is the simplicity of prayer. It is as simple as crying out unto the Lord. And I promise you, God understands the language of teardrops. He understands the language of crying. If someone, if you were, we're, we're going to, on our way out to Vegas, we're going to stop at Grand Canyon. If I'm out at Grand Canyon and I'm hearing somebody going, Ah, help! I'm going to go find out who's hanging from a ledge somewhere. As a matter of fact, when the electricity stopped and I fell to the ground, I went, ah! like that. And I was not joking. My son Matthew was playing out in the yard and heard me. Had he not been there, I don't know what I would have done. Because I wasn't moving. I didn't know what I touched. 
Then he went and got his grandpa, and he, we were the only three home. This was a Saturday, Lisa and Gloria, and all the kids were out shopping. God made sure that when that happened, and I cried, someone heard that voice. Sterling knew to pull the meter, but by then I couldn't move anyway. But I'm here to tell you, I've been through enough deals. I've learned how to fast and pray. I learned how to get in a closet and pray. And I mean pray for my life. Pray. But I have also learned the simplicity of crying to God. Who understands the language even of a baby who cries. And if God can understand that. Can he not understand what it is that you need. When you need it. And how to do it better than you can. You're still the baby in God's eyes. And don't let anybody take away from you that simplicity ever this afternoon since we're not having church you're going to go home you're going to study the word cry in the book of psalms cry cried crying criest i think that's about the only four there's no cryingly there's no crying -er. so that, about those four words in the book of psalms you're going to finish this sermon for me. And you're going to let God show you that when you cry, He'll answer. And it's that simple. Let's bow our heads.